I call the National Assembly to order, and at the outset I'd like to welcome Mariam Jack Denton, the Speaker of the National Assembly of the Gambia, leading a delegation visiting the National Assembly today. So a warm welcome, Speaker, and your delegation. The first item on our agenda is an emergency question. I have accepted the question, understanding order 12.67, and I call on Adam Price to ask the emergency question. Thank you, Chloe. What plans the Welsh, has the Welsh Government made to respond to the consequences of Carillion entering liquidation? Thank you, Chloe. Although we expect only a little direct impact, the liquidation of Carillion will have little impact in Wales, but the Welsh Government will do everything within its ability to assess Carillion staff who are affected here. Welsh Government officials continue to assess any further impacts in a situation that continues to develop swiftly. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I hope we can get a little more detail on some of the specific projects. The Welsh Government uh, contracts uh, awarded uh, to Carillion were awarded after July, the time the, uh, of the first uh, profits warning issued by the company. Um, after the second and third uh, profits warning in September and November uh, last year, uh, did the Government discuss contingency arrangements with Abellio? in relation to Carillion's role as the nominated contractor as part of their uh, rail franchise bid. And uh, can the Cabinet Secretary further advise us if there's no material risk that Apelio's bid is effectively uh, null and void, uh, as it is in effect naming a nominated contractor that no longer exists and therefore rendering it liable to legal challenge? Finally, is the whole uh, Carillion experience, which has left so many uh, smaller subcontractors and their employees carrying the can effectively for, for a large company's mismanagement and in, in uh, reckless profiteering, does it give us pause for thought in our over-reliance still on externally owned uh, contracting co conglomerates for our civil engineering work? There must surely be a better way going forward. Uh, thank the member for what I take to be three main uh, questions. In relation to contracts that the Welsh Government has, there is one contract, a contract in relation to uh, the design phase of Junction 15 and 16 on the A55, which was awarded after the original uh, warning about Carillion in July of next year. Uh, at the point that that uh, warning was issued, the procurement process was paused. Further assurances were sought from uh, the company. Uh, those uh, assurances were received and risks that might have been involved uh, were mitigated. Uh, no other contract has been awarded since July of last year. Uh, as far as uh, Abellio is concerned and the franchise arrangements uh, there, I think there are a number of points which uh, I should make. First of all, directly in answer to Adam Price, uh, is question transport for Wales. Um, having seen the developments uh, in July and during the autumn, uh, have been uh, involved in uh, making sure that the necessary financial uh, underpinning of bids uh, is reliable, and uh, they have been in discussions with Abellio on that uh, basis. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of events earlier this week, the Cabinet Secretary has taken uh, legal advice uh, so that we are clear as to whether there are any impacts from uh, the, uh, um, these developments for the franchise um, process. The company uh, itself is taking action to make sure that it is in a position to go forward with a bid if it chooses uh, that course. Uh, of action, and the Welsh Government remains committed to a final outcome in the tender uh, process, which leads to the improvement in services that people in Wales uh, wish to see secured. Uh, the third question the member raises the broadest one, uh, of course. Um, he will have seen, I'm sure, um, a 
piece in the Financial Times uh, today called The Problem of Bigness, uh, in which uh, the author teases out the difficulties that occur for uh, public contracting uh, organisations in a market where there has been radical consolidation and a number of players in the field uh, doesn't necessarily give rise to genuine uh, competition. Uh, so that inevitably uh, does uh, come to the fore in the Carillion uh, experience, and he's right to point to the fact that all public authorities that are involved in securing necessary uh, services through going out to contract will want to review this experience, learn the lessons uh, from it, and to make sure that public funds are not exposed unnecessarily in the future. Russell George. Uh, yeah. Geoff uh, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you about um, any work you've done or you're uh, going to be commissioned in terms of um, the, uh, the consequences of uh, this company going into liquidation in terms of the wider economic uh, conditions that this is going to bring to the Welsh economy and especially small businesses? Um, but can I also ask you, um, Adam Price has, has raised questions about the, the rail franchise, but can I press you a little bit more about the projects which may well be affected in Wales, you said there would be little uh, effect to projects in Wales, but can I just press you a little bit more on that for some further um, uh, clarification on which projects may well be affected? And can I also ask about projects in Wales that are perhaps about to be started or in the middle of construction that are, are not um, being, um, that perhaps are being uh, operated or project managed by, uh, not Carillion, but another company, I think of Newtown Bypass of my own constituency as an example, managed by Alan Griffiths contractors, but may well depend on suppliers for steel, for bridges or other project management uh, um, consequences as, as well, and about how, what conversations you may have had with them in terms of how projects in Wales may be uh, uh, affected or be <laughs> potentially delayed. Uh, thank you, Llywydd. Well, the member is right that uh, while the direct exposure of uh, the Welsh Public Service to Carillion is uh, modest. That does not mean to say that there aren't businesses and subcontractors in Wales who, in the other aspects of Carillion's work, may now find themselves uh, exposed as a result of Carillion's uh, demise. So uh, officials of the Welsh Government uh, are carrying out the necessary work to try to identify where those difficulties may uh, lie. We are in discussions both with the FSB and the CBI about that and using the networks that the Welsh Government has across Wales so that if there are uh, difficulties that emerge of the sort that the member has identified, we are alert to them and are able to offer such help as we are able to uh, in those circumstances. Uh, there are, Cabinet yeah, Secretary, there are, there are obviously ethical and very practical issues, um, both of which I'd like to address. I mean, we know the history of Carillion. We've debated it in this chamber in terms of its anti-trade unionism, its blacklisting, and its, its attacks on terms and conditions of, of, of workers. Uh, and that's a model that's obviously contributed to its current downfall. <laughs> And I'm sure you will agree with me that it's a welcome sign that the UK government is now investigating the Carillion uh, uh, directors. Uh, and I'm sure you would agree with me also that investigation probably needs to go further to the bankers who have speculatively uh, uh, backed the company and indeed the government ministers who appear to have been so keen to line the pockets of the shareholders and the directors uh, with goals, with contracts, when there were, there were clear warnings out but do you agree with me that the most important bit is this? We have a number of Welsh companies, many of whom actually trade in England as well, who will now potentially not be paid. Uh, they will now potentially be at risk of going under. There are workers who have had their pension funds that have also been robbed, and that we need to examine the impact on the Welsh economy of those particular companies, and in particular, what support we can give. But in terms of the, the ethical question, isn't it the fact that we have an economic model that is basically about squeezing profits for the few, robbing the workers' pension funds, and expecting the public at the end of the day to bail them out? And that is something that we can be so grateful that Welsh Government has not gone down this particular road. Well, so in successive Welsh Governments have not been prepared to follow the model that McAntony has just uh, outlined. We have always been 
alert to the dangers of a way of conducting business in which profit is privatised and risk is socialised. And that's what, exactly what you've seen in, the Carol, uh, in this uh, example. Here is a company which, from public money, has been giving dividends to its shareholders, is prepared to go on paying its senior executives well beyond the point where that was a sensible course of action uh, to take. And when it all goes wrong, when their friends over there go wrong, what happens? What happens then? You expect the public purse to step in. You expect the public to pay for your mistakes. And in Wales, in Wales, that's a course of action we've never been prepared to follow. That's why we don't have and won't have in Wales the sort of handing over to the private sector public services that ought to be publicly provided and publicly paid for. That's why we don't have fire service personnel delivering meals in school in Wales uh, today. Yes, there are lessons to be taken from Carillion. Luckily in Wales, we'd learnt them well before the party opposite. Jonathan Saunders. with and back to my lovely constituency of Aber Conway and thank you for making reference to uh, junctions 15 and 16 on the A55 um, and the, uh, the removal of the roundabouts. Those works have been long promised by this Welsh Government so it's understandable that now with uh, Carillion having gone into liquidation that many of my constituents are asking me what's going to happen where those works are concerned. Cabinet Secretary, is there a chance that I can go back to my constituency and tell my residents, our motorists and our, you know, our visitors, that you will actually look at um, getting on with these works? And maybe why don't we uh, look towards more local procurement? Uh, I cannot see why these works could not have been carried out. We have local companies in our area that could have carried out these works. But will you please um, look at getting on with these works? Because the old ups on the A55 and the terrible problems we have, um, Carillion Car has gone now into liquidation, but we still have that situation on the A55 that is really affecting our motorists and our residents. So anything you could do would really be appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I uh, fully appoint, appreciate the points that Jennifer Saunders uh, has made. Carillion uh, was contracted in the design phase only uh, so far of the uh, junctions 15 and 16 of the A55, uh, and there would have been about 12 months of that design work still uh, to go. And the Welsh Government will look to see whether there are ways in which we can respond to these difficulties uh, in a way that does not lead to that timetable being uh, elongated. I mean, these are very early uh, days, but just to give her an example of the sort of actions we will look to explore, there are subcontractors in that contract actually carrying out uh, the work. Maybe it will be possible for one of those subcontractors to become the main contractor to carry on uh, that work and to complete uh, the important developments at that junction, which I know matter to her constituents and to others who use that uh, part of the A55 without uh, further uh, delay. Uh, Chloe, I, I ought to apologise to Russell George for failing to have uh, answered the first part uh, of his uh, question. If I could very briefly uh, say to him, there are two other uh, contracts that uh, we have. There is the contract at the Llandewi Brevi uh, section of the A40, where the design phase is more or less uh, complete, uh, and where we will now have to think about how we take forward the second uh, phase of a three-phase uh, contract. Uh, and then there was section three of the A465, uh, which has been completed, which is already uh, open, where there is a small-scale landscape contract uh, that would have lasted for five years with Carillion beyond the opening uh, of that section three of the Heads of the Valleys Road, where halfway through that five-year period, we will now have to find uh, another way of fulfilling the remaining two and a half years. But that is the full extent of the exposure of the Welsh Government to Carillion in the contracts that the member mentioned. Simon Thomas. Uh, diolch, uh, um, Thank you, Chloe. Thank you for your response to questions today. But I have to say that I was surprised to hear that a contract had been awarded in North Wales on the A55 once you had 
heard about the news in July about the status of this company because that, of course, is exactly what John Trickett was criticising the Conservatives on very harshly in the Commons yesterday, giving contracts once the problems had been uncovered in the business pages of the Financial Times and elsewhere. So I do think the government needs to reconsider how they deal with the remains of Carillion now and particularly what's implicit here in terms of the Arbelio and the franchise and Arbelio's bid for that rail franchise. But to refer to the question that you've just referred to, the improvements to the A50 in Pemblewin, Arbelio, not Carillion rather, is supposed to commence that work this summer as I understood things. Now, will there be any delays in this project and what specific steps are the Welsh Government taking now to ensure that important works that in turn lead to economic consequences in those areas will not be delayed for too long for the benefit of those travelling on our roads and for economic development in Wales? I thank Simon Thomas for those additional questions. Junction 1516 A55 that the whole business of awarding uh, a contract had been completed before the profits warning of the 10th of uh, July, but contract letters had not been sent out to the company. So at that point, the sending out of uh, award letters was withheld, and a further set of investigations were carried out with Carillion uh, PLC to determine if they were risks that needed to be uh, identified. So there was a further period of due diligence in which formal assurances were sought and obtained uh, from uh, the company. Um, and officials who were responsible for carrying out that assessment believed that the necessary assurances had been uh, obtained. There was an equal or there was an, an, a different risk that had the award not been made, the company itself may have sought to have had that decision uh, reviewed because the ordinary processes had been properly uh, completed and they had won the contract. So there was a risk that they themselves would have uh, sought to take action, giving rise to a further set uh, of delays of the sort that Janet uh, Finn Saunders mentioned earlier and that understandably local citizens would have been keen uh, to avoid. So there was a balance of risk to be uh, drawn up. It was very purposefully and thoroughly investigated. Um, turning to his point about the Llandewi uh, Velfri Penblewin section of the A40, uh, uh, that is a three-phase uh, contract. The first phase is more or less uh, completed. There will be choices to be made, which the uh, minister responsible will now uh, want to weigh up. In this case as well, there are substantial subcontractors uh, involved in the scheme, and it is possible that one of them may be in a position to become the main contractor, and the advantage of that would certainly be that it would reduce uh, delay. But the uh, opportunity is there if the Cabinet Secretary prefers to go out to tender uh, for the next phase uh, of that contract to see what the market has to offer and to secure the best value for Welsh public uh, expenditure. The downside of that is that it inevitably uh, involves uh, delay. Uh, in the very short period of time since uh, the Carillion uh, collapse uh, occurred, uh, officials have been identifying options and no doubt they will put advice to ministers and ministers will then decide between them. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and may I apologise to the Cabinet Secretary if I was too eager to call the next supplementary question. It was entirely unintentional on my behalf, but I apologise for interrupting your response this afternoon. So the next item on our agenda is questions to the First Minister, and the first question is from Joyce Watson. Uh, uh, does the Welsh Government intend to ban wild animals in circuses in Wales? Well, during business questions last week, the Cabinet Secretary for Energy, Planning and Rural Affairs agreed to issue a written statement on mobile animal exhibits, including circuses, before the spring half-term recess. Uh, I thank you uh, for uh, that uh, 
answer, First Minister, uh, I think uh, the uh, whole tenure of my question uh, leads you to believe that I think that we ought to uh, ban uh, wild animals uh, from the use in circuses. And I look forward uh, to us bringing that uh, forward. And it is the case, of course, that England have announced that they're moving in this direction. They've only announced, let's not get carried away, with a move in this direction. But at the same time, Scotland have actually moved in this direction. <coughs> so I do urge the government to send uh, a crystal clear message to travelling circuses, because we don't have any resident circuses in Wales, uh, that if they have wild animals on board, that they are not welcome in Wales, but it's outdated uh, practice that needs uh, to be stopped. So uh, whilst we're going through the process, and I welcome the fact that we are making a move in this direction, uh, at the same time, I hope you'll send that message in the interim. Well, well it, it's clear following the recent consultation on licensing of mobile animal exhibits that there's widespread support for a ban on the use of wild animals in circuses and officials are considering how to address this issue. It goes without saying that the way that we treat our animals is an important reflection of the values of our society. Now, the, the consultation closed on the 9th of October uh, and I know that the uh, Minister is actively considering now the best way forward. Paul Davis. First Minister, there are some very real concerns that the proposed definition of mobile animal exhibits in the recent government consultation is too broad and would put at risk any system in terms of a licensing being disproportionate or impractical. So can you tell us how the Welsh Government will tackle these concerns so that any progress in this area is proportionate and truly leads to a ban on the use of, use of wild animals in circuses in Wales? Because that's what I think the people of Wales want to see. Well, that will be part of the consideration which will be published uh, by the Minister over the ensuing weeks. We want, of course, to ensure that we have a scheme that has a permanent impact on animal welfare standards in order to, of course, ensure that we improve the standards of animal welfare in Wales. What concerns me on this issue is that Wales could become a haven for circuses using wild animals. Scotland has banned their use. Westminster is considering a ban, Wales is falling behind in this area, despite the fact that the UK leader of your party is in favour of a ban. So what exactly is holding you back? And wasn't it a mistake to confuse two things in this consultation? Isn't it a simple matter of introducing a ban on wild animals in circuses and then looking at what needs to be done in terms of mobile exhibits in rural areas and so on? No, I believe that what has been done in the consultation is correct and we don't wish to be a haven, can I just say that to the member, we don't want to be a haven where wild animals can come to Wales, although that there is a ban in the other nations of the United Kingdom and even in the Republic of Ireland, so that is not the intention. What we are considering now is the best way forward in order to ensure the welfare of these animals. Question two, Nick Ramsey. Will the First Minister outline the Welsh Government's priorities for the NHS in Monmouthshire? Yes, our priorities for the NHS in Monmouthshire are the same as they are for the whole of Wales. We'll continue to protect investment in the health service and deliver the range of commitments set out in taking Wales forward. Now, First Minister, if I can ask you about dementia care, and there's deep concern in and around Chepstow at the planned closure of the purpose-built dementia ward at Chepstow Community Hospital and the relocation of services to St Wallace Hospital in Newport. And Iron Bevan Local Health Board have cited staff shortages as one of the reasons for this. Uh, this is at consultation phase at the moment. If this goes ahead, it will represent the loss of Monmouthshire's entire inpatient dementia provision and a combined reduction in provision in Newport and Monmouthshire from 29 to 14 beds. Will you urge the Health Board to reconsider these floor plans to protect Chepstow's hospital's valuable resources and to find a more sustainable solution to the problem the Health Board is currently facing? Well, I am aware of the changes that have been made. I'm also aware that the Health Board has undertaken a 12-week public consultation. That's still open. 
uh, and I'd encourage all views to be fed into that uh, consultation. I'm also aware that the Health Board has discussed options for the future development of Chepstow Community Hospital and has established a working group to develop proposals for the future of the excellent local uh, facilities. And I further understand that the Health Board is expecting an initial report to be presented in the spring. Question in our Questions now from the party leaders. Leader of the UKIP group, Neil Hamilton. Um, the First Minister will agree with me that in order to secure value for money in public contracts, it's desirable that there should be a reasonable spread of credible bidders. It wasn't entirely clear to me from the answer which the Finance Secretary gave to Adam Price earlier what the legal impact is going to be of the collapse of Carillion in relation to Abelio's bid. Uh, there are only three bidders in the contest at the moment. If Abelio uh, is removed from it, that means, of course, well, there are only two bids. Um, what are the implications of this for that general principle of securing value for money by having credible competition for these big contracts? This is a contract which affects not just the Wales and Border Rail franchise, but also the electrification of the Valleys lines as part of the Metro project. Uh, and this contract will be let for 15 years. So, so it has long-term consequences. I wonder if the First Minister could uh, give us a little more <coughs> clarification on this point. Well, well it's no secret that our preferred uh, scenario would have been to be able to run uh, Welsh railways via a not-for-profit, uh, arms-length, Welsh government-owned business. But we were prevented from doing that by the Conservative government in London. Uh, happy to let Scotland do it. Yeah. But as far as Wales are concerned, not happy to let... He's groaning away, the Leader of the Opposition again, not supporting this, of course. But the reality is that we were prevented from doing that. But that, nevertheless, was our preferred option. We were stopped from doing it. But he asked the question about Abellio. Transport for Wales has the appropriate expertise in place to deal with this. We're in discussions with um, Abellio Rail Cymru about the complex situation. And it is complex. It arises from the uh, announcement. Uh, whilst the difficulties encountered by part part of one of the consortium bidders is disappointing, it is important we remain focused on the evaluation to keep procurement on uh, track. I can say that Transport for Wales continue to evaluate the competitive bids uh, received whilst ensuring a quality of treatment of the bidders in line with procurement law. Well, what's happened this week, uh, whilst it couldn't have been predicted with confidence, there was clearly a a high possibility that Carillion was going to get into difficulties from which it couldn't extricate itself. After all, we had the first profit warning in July. In September, the shares in Carillion fell by 60% in two days. Three weeks after that, there was another profits warning. On the 17th of November, uh, the Carillion uh, warned that it was on course to breach its banking covenants, which must have gone to the heart of uh, the credibility of that part of Abelio's bid, and considering they were the preferred construction partner, this obviously had immense implications for the credibility of that bid. Um, was there any uh, action taken by Transport for Wales or any involvement by Welsh Government in the period after July to try to, uh, to protect the bidding process against the possibility of the collapse of Carillion's bid? Uh, not Carillion, uh, Abelio's bid. Uh, because if Abelio had been able to uh, uh, obtain some other construction partner or keep one in the wings in the meantime, that might have been able to save this element of the bidding process. I think there are dangers in Transport for Wales engaging in that way with a bidder. Uh, there has to be distance between uh, Transport for Wales and the bidders themselves. It is a matter for Delia Rail Cymru to put themselves in a situation where they are confident that their bid can move forward and discussions will continue uh, along those lines uh, in terms of how that can be, uh, that can be done. But uh, we know that there was a profit warning in July. I don't think, well, hindsight is a wonderful thing, but I don't think anybody, let alone the UK government, could have known the scale of the problems within uh, Caribbean. Cle clearly, they were unprepared, uh, and I think that uh, many would have found themselves in that situation. I think it, the, the feeling might have been that Caribbean was were too big to fail, but unfortunately, we know that uh, that isn't the case. But nevertheless, we are talking about a part of one of the consortium bidders. It's a question now to see whether that part can be replaced. Well, it's clear that the answer to my question is that both the government and transport for Wales sat on its hands during that period. But uh, I'll leave that there. Does the First Minister share 
uh, my sort of amusement that Philip Green, the chairman of Carillion since 2014, was an advisor on corporate responsibility to David Cameron and Theresa May as Prime Minister, uh, that the previous chief executive of, of Carillion, Richard Hurston, was uh, allowed to leave the company uh, a few months ago with a 12-month payoff of £660,000 in salary and £28,000 in benefits. Whilst the company has been making small firms wait for up to 120 days for payment on their contracts. The, government, the Welsh Government has a policy on social responsibility in companies that are contracting with it, and surely prompt payment is one of the essential elements in that. The Welsh Government has a policy of paying all invoices on time, uh, and when the Welsh Government receives bids from firms for large contracts, which uh, it's going to award or um, agencies like Transport for Wales. Uh, what protection is going to be given to small firms who are now left, as in this instance, probably high and dry, lots of them will not be paid, and that could be pivotal in, in whether, uh, the question of whether small businesses themselves, as a ricochet effect from the collapse of Carillion, also go out of business. Cash flow is all to a small business. Uh, it's not clear yet what the extent of Carillion's collapse will be on small businesses in Wales. I know that the uh, Cabinet Secretary is um, looking to obtain information on that. But, of course, what we can't do is govern the way in which large businesses run themselves. There are many issues there that the leader of the UK has rightly highlighted. Uh, moral issues, and it seems to me that quite often in, in some businesses, not all, of course, not in most, that payments are, bonus payments are made regardless of performance, and also that people are paid off with substantial sums of money uh, in order to, uh, to go away even where performance is well below the standard uh, expected. There are issues there. There are issues in terms of how empowered shareholders are. They hold, of course, the board to uh, account, but in terms of knowledge, expertise, it's not quite as easy as that. And I think there are. Uh, as a result of what we've seen from Carillion, uh, lessons to be learned in terms of looking again at company law and the way in which companies govern themselves. Is there sufficient governance in larger companies to ensure that this kind of situation doesn't happen? We see from Carillion that the answer to that is no. Plaid Cymru leader Leanne Wood. First Minister, today's independent report on health and social care highlights the importance of staff well-being and it says that there should be a sharp focus on staff engagement and well-being. Now, all political parties regularly praise NHS staff and that's quite yeah. right. It's well-deserved because without them, the NHS would be nothing. Do you think enough is being done to support the well-being of NHS staff? Primarily for the, uh, the local uh, health boards, uh, but again, uh, I join with the Leader of Plaid Cymru in offering a tribute to the incredibly hard work that's been done by members of staff. I know that the uh, Director uh, of uh, Health and Social Services has been around uh, the different A&E departments around Wales listening to their experiences. Uh, we know the situation is, uh, is easing compared to what it was uh, a few weeks ago. But yes, we'd encourage local health boards, of course, to make sure that there are uh, the right mechanisms in place to ensure that staff feel uh, supported beyond the words that we as politicians express. First Minister, in recent weeks, um, disclosures have been made to me by uh, workers in our NHS about serious problems with staff morale and well-being. People serving on the front line claim to be at breaking point as a result of some of the pressures that have been put upon them. Now, I've only had permission to refer one of these disclosures so far, but the person has asked me specifically to raise it with you in government. First Minister, a serious allegation is being made that at times of high demand, ambulance service prioritisation is putting people at risk. In the past few weeks, it's alleged that patients categorised as suitable for a 20-minute response have had to wait up to six hours for an ambulance. I'm told that these include patients who have had a stroke, heart attacks and breathing problems. The person revealing this information to me is currently off sick with stress and cannot speak about their job without breaking down into tears. First Minister, how can this situation be defended and what are you going to do about it? Well, of course, knowing the, the, the full facts is difficult to give an answer today, but 
Uh, there is sufficient there for me to investigate, in my mind, and I will write to the leader of uh, Ply Cymru, uh, putting uh, to the Ambulance Trust the, um, the, what she has said today, and uh, when I get a response from them, I will, of course, share it with her. Thank you for that, First Minister. I would urge you as well to ask your Health Secretary <coughs> to assess the well-being of staff in the NHS. As the letter that I received mentions that councillors from a charity have had to be brought in to speak with ambulance control staff, such as the level of that stress. Now, if that is true, that is a really <coughs> shocking situation, and it's an emergency within our public services. Can you confirm that counselling has been offered to NHS staff? And when it comes to ambulance resources, can you assure us that uh, prioritisation will be under review and that responding to red calls is not putting anyone classed as an amber call at risk of death or further injury? Again, it needs further investigation. Uh, if the new reply can will allow me, I will investigate those further matters as well. Uh, and uh, when the response is received, I will, of course, share it with them. Leader of the Opposition, Andrew R. C. Davis. First Minister, the Government before Christmas brought out their new economic action plan, Prosperity for All. Uh, this is the fourth action plan that the Labour Party have brought forward since devolution started. Uh, the first one, a winning Wales in 1999, a vibrant economy in 2005, and a new, a new direction in 2009. Um, if you actually look at the document, it doesn't offer much hope as to how the Government are actually going to increase wages here in Wales, which are significantly below other parts of the United Kingdom. Them. In the 20 years that you've been in government here in Wales, or nearly 20 years you've been in government in Wales, GVA has only increased by half of 1%. It doesn't offer much hope as to exactly how you're going to get a real momentum behind GVA here in Wales. How can we have confidence that this document will be any different to the three predecessors that it had? Well, first of all, if we look at unemployment, unemployment is low in Wales and often lower than the UK average. In 1999, that would have been fanciful to claim that. We were perpetually above the UK average, and that is something that shows the success of what we've done to encourage business and investment. Secondly, there is a challenge in terms of increasing GVA per head. How, that, how is that done? To me, there are two ways. First of all, you ensure that when you look to uh, secure investment, it's investment that pays highly. In the late 80s and early 1990s, the policy pursued by his party was to replace well-paid jobs in coal and steel with badly paid, unskilled jobs. Uh, and so, although the unemployment rate did not necessarily increase, the GVA went down because the jobs weren't so highly paid. We saw at the end of the 90s and the early part of the last decade, many of those businesses leave Wales because they were going somewhere where wage rates were even lower. We are not prepared as a government to sell ourselves to the rest of the world on the basis that we are a cheap wage economy, which is what the Conservative government did in the early 1990s, and uh, on the basis that you know, come to Wales because it's cheap, no more. Uh, we see the fruits of that. We see, of course, the investment from companies like uh, Aston Martin. Uh, we see the further investment in, in Airbus up in the north. We've seen uh, investments from in Pembrokeshire uh, around the uh, port of, uh, of Milford Haven, all of which are much better paid than jobs that used to come here. That's one part of it. The second part is training. You know, the, the question we get asked more than any other when we speak to businesses who want to invest in Wales is, have you got the people with the skills that we need? And they're not interested in, in cost, they're interested in skills. And increasingly, we can answer that question positively. So it means working uh, with the FE colleges in terms of apprenticeships. We have our commitment to 100,000 all-age apprenticeships in the course of this assembly. It's by raising people's skill levels <laughs> that we can make sure they can put more money in their pockets and thus increase GVA. First Minister, you raised the issue about wages. If you take Scotland as an example, back in 1999, a Welsh worker and a Scottish worker took home the same take-home pay. Today, a Scottish worker takes home £49 more in the pay packet each week than a Welsh worker does. That's a fact. In this document, wages are only mentioned twice. Taxes, business taxes, are only mentioned once out of 17,000 words. Automation, which is the huge challenge we face, where potentially 35% of the workforce could lose their jobs or have their jobs remodelled over the next 20 years, has a bare mention in this document. There doesn't seem to be any answers around the real challenges that we do face in the next decade or two. And this document, I presume, is the driver for economic policy coming out of the government for at least the next four to five years, depending on the mandate. 
And yet again, I go back to this point. It is the fourth document that has come out of the Welsh Labour Party in government here in Wales. And I highlighted the po poverty in wages here in Wales as opposed to other parts of the United Kingdom. And this document doesn't have that solution. Give us some inspiration as to what we can look at in 2021 on wages, on wealth here in Wales, and above all, on companies re-establishing themselves here in Wales. Well, it's already the case that we, uh, we know there are challenges with automation. Indeed, my colleague Lee Waters, I think, has got a short debate in this tomorrow on automation. He is somebody who has, who has been very uh, keen to make sure that, that we look at the, um, the, the fourth industrial revolution, as it's, uh, as it's uh, <coughs> described. And I know it's something that the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary is, is very much uh, aware of. Hope. The hope is this. Wales is a place, a destination, where companies from all around the world want to come. The Wales is a place where people are seen as being innovative, as being entrepreneurial. A place where people have the skills that are needed to survive, not just in the next five or ten years, but beyond, to meet the challenges of uh, automation. A place where there's not a fragmented education system, that, but one that works together in order to make sure that people have those skills are, that are, are required. Uh, a country where there's a government that works closely with businesses, goes out, goes out to different uh, countries and encourages businesses to come to Wales and to invest in Wales. That's why we have the highest uh, figure for foreign direct investment for 30 years, but also a government that understands it's not a question of securing overseas investment, it's a, it's a question of ensuring that our SMEs continue to be established and to grow. One of the issues we face in the Welsh economy is that too many of our SMEs grow to a particular level and then sell. The owners sell to a bigger company. And there's always been that issue. How do we encourage those people to actually grow bigger, to have com more companies listed on the LSC, listed on the AIM, because we're underrepresented on them, uh, and want to grow, rather than say, well, I've done my bit now, I'm going to sell, uh, sell the business. We have the entrepreneurs, there's no question about it. I see it with the younger people. They have a drive and a confidence that we didn't have, because we were put off it actively when I was in school. Harnessing those people, making sure they have access to business support and advice, making sure they have access to support through Finance Wales, making sure that they have the skills that are needed to, to, uh, to, to uh, prosper in the future, that's the key to the Welsh economic uh, future that I want to see, and I believe the people of Wales want to see. I've had it put to me that that's the ladybook analogy of what you want for the economic future, First Minister, because, in fairness, there are 17,000 words in this document. I had hoped that you would have given us something firm, a roadmap, which would lift Welsh wages. As I've highlighted, over the 20 years, a Scottish worker is taking home £49 more in their pay packet than a Welsh worker is taking home. GVA has increased by half of 1% over the 20 years. That is hardly a record to be proud of. I want to see Wales thrive economically, just like the picture you've painted. But I had hoped that you would have drawn something out of this document that was brought forward by the Cabinet Secretary, because this is the blueprint that you're basing your economic model on. And it doesn't offer much, much hope when taxes are mentioned once, when wages are mentioned twice, and automation is only mentioned six times. And if I could ask you on taxes in particular, do you believe that the tax environment the government is bringing forward will make Wales a more competitive tax environment to attract businesses into Wales. I've had representations brought to me by businesses on the land transfer tax, the LTT, that shows that Wales will ultimately be at a disadvantage. And I know the Cabinet Secretary for Finance has met with industry leaders on this particular issue who are really concerned at the write-downs that businesses are going to have to put into their balance sheets because of the higher tax environment that your government is bringing forward. So do you believe that the tax environment that you will be creating here in Wales will put Wales at an advantage in attracting some of these new jobs and new enterprises that will help us tackle the automation generation that is coming our way? Well, I think he means Lady Bird Book rather than Lady Book. Uh, I trust that is the case. But he asks the question, am I confident in the land transaction tax and, and the, the tax environment it creates? The answer to that is, is yes. Am I confident that what we're doing as a government adapts? You mentioned the fact there were four different plans. Well, of course there are. If we set up the same plan from 1999, we'd be ossified in the past. In 1999, I remember... Dr Phil Williams, standing, us, standing up in the previous chamber and telling us all about broadband, and none of us knew what he was talking about. Uh, and he acknowledged that, in fairness to him, but he was ahead of the game. He was ahead of the game. In 1999, nobody talked about broadband. Now, of course, it's, it's a, a, a fact of life. So we have to adapt, and the fact we've had different approaches over the, over the last uh, 20 years is a sign that we have 
adapted to make sure we deal with the different circumstances that the world throws at us. And I have to say, I am more than happy to defend our record as a government on the economy, to defend our ideas, to defend the fact that we are a, a proactive government. We take stakes in businesses where we believe businesses are going to be successful. We put our money where our mouth is. Where are his ideas? Where are the Welsh Conservative ideas? I have absolutely no idea what that economic policy is. And judging by the blank looks on the faces over there, their heads are all down. I don't think they do either. By all means, let's have a debate on economic ideas, but let's hear what yours are first. Question three. Question three, Heaven David. Minister, make a statement on the ways in which health boards and local authorities can collaborate to ensure effective and joined up working. Well, standards can best be raised when partners work together. And this year, £60 million has been provided via the Integrated Care Fund to support health and social services to deliver a wide range of integrated services in response to their population assessments. With the parliamentary review of uh, health and social care in mind, um, I've been approached by, approached by constituents who um, have raised concerns about continuity of care uh, for children moving into adulthood. Um, and I remember Bevan University Health Board tell me they're working with their five local authority uh, partners in their area to try and move towards a pooled integrated service provision. Um, but this is proven a challenge, partly because of the range of bodies, but also because of the often tran difficult tra transition into adulthood for um, children uh, requiring continuity of care. Um, would the First Minister therefore agree to a review of the 2012 um, children and young people continuing uh, care guidance issued by the Welsh Government. I think it needs um, updating in the light of, the, of uh, social care delivered by local authorities and other, other partners. And therefore, we can then make sure that those transitioning into adulthood um, have a, a, a good chance of <coughs> continuity of care. Can I, can I thank uh, my colleague for that question? First of all, if he wishes to write to me with further details, I will look at the individual case. Uh, more closely. But secondly, as particularly about the guidance, I can say that that process has begun. We are setting up a group to consider the provision of continuing care for children and young people uh, and look to produce new guidance to replace the existing guidance, taking, of course, uh, taking into account, of course, developments since then. Angela Burns, uh, yeah. Dear, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, First Minister, a key finding of the parliamentary review into health and social care. Um, found that there were a plethora of national boards overseeing work programmes outside of organisational structures. And a clear recommendation was that these boards should be streamlined in order to ensure more effective delivery of public services. Notwithstanding the changes that might be coming along to health and social uh, services, this is a concern that has arisen in other areas of public services. There's lots of reporting, not so much doing. Will you consider looking at a review to streamline um, the boards that we have throughout the whole of the public sector and to ensure that the boards, um, the, uh, the collaboration boards that we do have in place and the programme boards that we have in place are effective and do work together really well and to get rid of those that are not so that we can really focus on delivering the transformation we all desperately need to see? Well, can I say, I, I'm aware, of course, that the review itself is a, is a, a cross-party review. I think the review deserves full consideration by all parties with a, with, a, with a full response. What I can say to her, though, she, she makes the point, you know, obviously sensibly, uh, that we want to see borders removed. Um, I know that the review laid out a vision of seamless health and care without artificial boundaries between primary and secondary care, uh, health and social care, and that is entirely consistent with what we want to see as well. So getting that done is the next step in terms of uh, considering what the review has found. Rina Piarwell. Thank you very much. I drew to the attention of the Cabinet Secretary for Health the problem of ambulance taxis being cancelled at the very last moment, something that causes distress to patients who have been waiting a while to go to hospital. In a response I received on the 8th of January, the Cabinet Secretary said that he was disappointed to hear of these concerns, that a transformation programme is being implemented to make improvements in this area and that collaboration with the local government is part of the solution. But when can I tell my constituents that they can expect to see this important part of the health service being stabilised because to date, despite the programme, it's clear that it's not working. 
Well, I will ask the Cabinet Secretary to write to the member in order to ensure that a full response is given to his question. Brian Jones. First Minister, sadly we see the results when our health boards and local authorities fail to work together effectively. Patients forced to stay in hospital far longer than necessary or patients discharged without a care package in place. First Minister, I have been contacted by numerous elderly patients and have been left to fend for themselves after being discharged from hospital. What is your government going to do to ensure that everyone who is discharged from hospital has adequate care in place during their recuperation? Well, that shouldn't happen, of course. It's a matter for local authorities to ensure that uh, that doesn't happen. The Integrated Care Fund is designed to ensure that the, barrier between, uh, the bar barriers that stop people leaving hospital in, in order to return home are uh, reduced and indeed removed. I can say that the latest published figures on delayed transfers of care uh, do record a reduction of 0.7 per cent of the number of delays across Wales compared to the October 2017 period, and that total is 6 per cent down on the same period uh, last year and lower than the totals reported in the equivalent uh, period in the preceding uh, two years. To me, that's a sign. But the, the integrated care fund and the money we have invested in that are having a positive effect on so many people's lives. Question, Pedwar. Question four, Rina Bjorwerth. Thank you very much. Will the First Minister make a statement on communicating with people who are waiting for superfast broad broadband services? Well, information on the introduction of Superfast Cymru is available on the Welsh Government website and providing effective information will be a, um, a key requirement of any future project. A constituent from Talwood contacted me recently, not that he was angry because he didn't have any Superfast broadband, but now that he's found out that it has been available for some months and he wasn't aware of this and as it happens I'm in the same situation where a neighbour told me that we could access Superfast Broadband and have been able to do so for a few months and this is very frustrating for people who've been waiting a long time and I think it's part of the terrible lack of communication that's existed between Openreach and the public in terms of the rollout of superfast broadband. So will the First Minister give a commitment to put pressure again on Openreach to inform people when connections are available? Because waiting for the connection can take long enough, but when you found that it has been available that you weren't aware, that's very frustrating indeed. It has not been adequate, and there was a campaign over the past three years going up to next year in order to promote the promotion of super fast broadband and we are reconsidering how we can improve the communication on this because the people uh, who have the service can receive it and understand that it's there it's one thing that it's to be uh, um, that it's available but one has to be able to use it too and we want to consider the way in which we communicate in order to ensure that they are informed uh, First Minister, can I say I think the Superfast Cymru uh, programme has been a, a public uh, communications disaster. Uh, certainly my constituents have been repeatedly promised uh, fibre broadband only to be told that an, uh, that, that an upgrade uh, will be delayed on several occasions and now that they find that they've been left in the lurch because open reach has run out of time. Uh, in a letter to me on the 11th of January, the Leader of the House uh, said, and I quote in a letter, the provision of superfast broadband connection under the Superfast Cymru project was never promised to any area or community, only scheduled. <laughs> now, that, to me, is a complete uh, cop-out. Households have been promised that uh, repeatedly that they would receive an upgrade by the end of 2017. So can I ask, what is your message to these uh, households? What lessons have you learned? And can you give uh, any assurance uh, that premises who were previously in scope uh, will now be included in any successor scheme? Well, first of all, we're in the hands of BT in terms of the uh, physical uh, works that are taking forward. Uh, what I can say is I do understand that there are people who, feel, who now feel because the contract has come to an end, therefore nothing else will happen. Uh, can I say to the member that we are considering uh, what further steps we can now take, because I, I, I understand I've heard stories around Wales that, that literally structure has been left half finished as a result of the contract finishing. We're aware of that. 
Uh, it would seem a great shame uh, if that were to happen. Uh, so I can say to him and his constituents that we are actively considering uh, how best to ensure uh, that more people are uh, connected uh, and looking again at how we can uh, help to connect uh, many more communities and households beyond the end of the contract at the end of last year. Lee Waters. First Minister, because of Welsh Government investment, there's no doubt that thousands of households across the Llanelli constituency now have access to super fast uh, broadband. But in the community of Binier, just outside of Llanelli, they've been treated appallingly by BT Openreach. They were told they'd have access uh, by the end of the year. They have appalling <laughs> speeds. And just uh, before Christmas, were told that because they've reached their target, they'd have to wait until any future successor scheme. This clearly isn't good enough. My colleague Nia Griffith held a meeting with residents and with BT on Saturday morning, and they were told they'd now have to cobble together a, a community bid. Uh, they are very frustrated by this. So can the Welsh Government make sure that, as this communicates the next phase, they make sure these left-behind groups are now reached and reached quickly? Well, I, I can well imagine the uh, concern, if not anger, that the people in Binia uh, feel. I think from the, from the member's tone, this was a, a part of the Superfast Company contract rather than a commercial uh, contract, over which, of course, we have, we have no control. Uh, but it is something that we'll continue to address with BT with a view to uh, looking again at, at uh, communities that were promised uh, or appear to have been promised to have services but have not had those services delivered with a view to delivering those services in, uh, in the future. So we are very much aware that there will be uh, communities and premises around Wales who, who feel that they should have had uh, access to uh, the superfast uh, broadband, who have not yet received it, and we are now looking at ways to, 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 to try to ensure that they do receive it in the future. Question, Pim, Beth and Jenkins. Question five, Beth and Jenkins. Will the First Minister outline how the Welsh Government can improve financial security for people in Wales? Our financial inclusion delivery plan sets out our work with partner organisations. This is improving access to affordable credit, financial services and financial information and improves financial capability in Wales. Thank you. A broader mar market for credit unions in other developed nations. We look at Ireland where there's been 77% in the last year and 50% in the United States and the figures for Wales in terms of uh, credit union membership, 69,000 members here, but 561 in Northern Ireland alone. So I wonder whether the Welsh Government could do more to facilitate the development of credit unions in Wales, given that the larger banks are withdrawing from local communities. So is it possible to create a national network of credit unions which could be successful and could replace the high street banks which are withdrawing from our communities in order to ensure that those services remain in place for people in Wales. I sympathise greatly with uh, what the member is saying. I may pay tribute to her for the work that she has done in order to ensure that uh, people um, are, become more financially literate. And of course it um, helps them avoid those who charge a great deal for lending money. There is, it is true to say that there is um, more potential in credit unions and it's true to say they've been in Ireland for much longer than in Wales and in the credit unions there actually do lend a great deal of money. The people can get mortgages from credit unions there. As regards the network of credit unions, I think that is something which is well worth considering and I will ensure that the Minister will communicate with her in order to see how we can strengthen the presence of credit unions in the communities of Wales, bearing in mind that the banks are withdrawing from so many communities in order to give people the opportunity to control their financial lives in a way which benefits them. Although children who gain experience of budgeting, spending and saving from early age are more likely to be able to manage their finances as they take on financial responsibilities, they grow older. Research from the Money Advice Service on the financial capability of children, young people and parents in Wales launched during last November's Financial Capability Week <coughs> found that many young people about to turn 18 in Wales are ill-prepared uh, for dealing with adult financial responsibilities, that just 35% of children between 7 and 17 had learned about money management in school, and only 7% had talked to their teachers about money. 
Will you, uh, therefore, um, uh, encourage your government to revisit the recommendations of the 2010 Communities and Culture Committee report on financial inclusion and the impact of financial education, uh, which um, make clear recommendations uh, in these areas? Uh, and can you also confirm what role, if any, the Welsh Government will be taking in UK Government proposals for a breathing space scheme to provide individuals in debt with up to six weeks free from interest charges and enforcement to give them time to seek uh, financial advice, hopefully, and I declare an interest from independent third sector bodies such as uh, those two of my daughters work for, providing this impartial advice uh, to people. Mm. Uh, firstly, I, I agree entirely with him about the, the, the need for young people to be financially educated. I think part of the problem is that, that money, despite what happened in 2008, still appears to be freely available in a way that it wasn't uh, when I was younger, when <laughs> loans were not as freely available as they are, they are now. With the, in the days when well, my first car loan carried an interest rate of 29%, I remember that very vividly uh, and painfully. Uh, and the, for many people, they find it very difficult to, to manage. They've not been shown how to manage. Uh, sometimes people learn through their families, sometimes people don't have that ability to learn and don't have an example that they can, they can follow. Uh, it is part, I understand, of the curriculum, of the new curriculum, uh, so that it will be there to enable uh, young people to be able to manage their, their help them to manage their finances in, uh, in the future, because the point is well made. Uh, how do you, as a youngster, cope with all the, quite often, money that's being thrown at you, or debts thrown at you for many, many people, uh, without uh, any kind of help available to you? That's, that, that point is, is, is well made, and it's included in the, in the curriculum. In terms of the issue of breathing space, uh, I know this is something uh, that has been uh, raised. Uh, it is something that we need to consider uh, as to how we, if we take, look to take it forward, how we take it forward, whether it's on a Wales basis or working with other countries in the, uh, in the UK. But to my mind, anything that enables people uh, to have a respite from uh, debt, and particularly continuing debt that people often find on their shoulders, must be a welcome thing. Question where... Question six. I apologise. Fiona Passmore. Yeah, Fifth Minister, following the Tory UK government's hollow budget at the end of last year, the Welsh government's budget will be once again lower in real terms in 2019-20 than it was in 2010-11. The Welsh Labour government has repeatedly asserted that for the Welsh economy to grow, which will consequently improve the financial security for the Welsh people, it is critically important that the UK government commit to important infrastructure projects in Wales. First Minister, what representations and actions have the Welsh Government made to ensure projects like the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon, electrification of the London Paddington to Swansea Railway Line and the much needed further investment in our railway infrastructure become a reality? Well, we've made representations very strongly. We get 1.5% of railway infrastructure investment. 1.5%. Uh, we have more than, you know, on a balance share, it will be over 6%, uh, but that's not what we get. And still the UK Government refused to devolve railway infrastructure plus a bar share of that spending to us. We still have no decision on the tidal lagoon. We made the point last week, we have put our cards on the table as a Welsh Government. We have said that we are prepared to make a financial contribution, take a stake in the, uh, in the lagoon. We make no apologies for that. Silence, as far as the UK Government is concerned. Silence from the Conservative benches. Silence from the Conservative benches. This is a major project. This is a major project that needs a decision. Twelve months have gone by since the review that was put in place to assess whether this project should go ahead. It said the project should go ahead. Still, we have no response at all. It is, uh, oh, I, I'm being told by Dan, my attitude doesn't help as if I was a schoolboy. I'm the First Minister of Wales. I've got every opportunity and right to, to represent the people of Wales in regard to the UK Government. The UK Government isn't actually making progress. And I'm sorry, we have had 12 months of reasonableness and nothing has been delivered. It is about time that we saw the commitment from the UK Government that the Welsh Government has made and a commitment that is made to creating up to 1,000 jobs in Wales and a sustainable green energy sector. We stand ready to work with the UK Government, but we need the UK Government and the Welsh Conservative Party to be vocal in support of the lagoon. Now, question Question six, Leanne Wood. Will the First Minister make a statement on the use of public space protection orders in Wales? Well, public spaces protection orders are a matter for local authorities. 
Labour-controlled Newport Council are seeking to amend their public space protection order to include a blanket no-begging restriction as part of a crackdown on aggressive or intimidating begging. It is the view of homelessness charity Wallach that aggressive begging is already prohibited under the existing PSPO and that shifting begging off the streets will only make it harder to provide support for those people who need help with homelessness services. Although the hands of the Welsh Government are tied in terms of preventing local authorities from <coughs> imposing these restrictions, can you please give us your view on such blanket bans on begging? And can you issue <coughs> guidance to local authorities, urging them to uh, seek a much more compassionate response? Yeah. One of the things I noticed uh, in the late 80s when I first went to London was that there were people begging on the streets, numbers of them. And I remember thinking, oh, I wouldn't like to see this in Wales. But it happened in the 90s, and it's still there now, as we know. Uh, at the end of the Second World War, begging largely disappeared from the streets of the UK. It re-emerged under a Tory government in the 80s and 90s. From my perspective, I, I think there are two issues here. First of all, there is no doubt that many people find aggressive begging intimidating. But the answer is not simply to say, well, just get rid of them, that's the end of it. Because there has to be a twin track approach. Yes, people don't want to, you know, many people do feel that they don't want to see people begging on the street, but there has to be an alternative where people can go, where people don't feel that they have to beg, where people get the support that they need, uh, where they're given uh, a roof over their heads and get that support. You know, we're not in the days of the, uh, of the Vagrants Act, where, where people were uh, effectively criminalised because they were, they were homeless. It does need a compassionate approach. She is right. Uh, and, that means ensuring, and that means ensuring that where there are plans to, uh, to deal with the issue of begging on the streets, that there are places people can go in order that they feel they don't have to do that in the first place. John Griffiths. Mr Minister, for the reasons that uh, you've mentioned and others, we do have a worrying level of rough sleeping and begging on our streets and I think that's been very visible and noticeable to all of us and the public in general. We do need constructive responses. So I wonder if you would agree with me that um, Newport Bid representing city centre traders and businesses in Newport together with partners such as Newport City Council are providing that sort of thinking in looking at a diverted giving scheme uh, which is proposed at the moment which would involve people donating to participating shops rather than giving to those begging on the streets, uh, with that money then going to provide additional services and support. Uh, I wonder if you would join me in welcoming uh, that uh, proposed initiative in Newport uh, as a way of dealing with the very practical issues and making sure that vulnerable people are better supported. Well, it's an example of what, what I was saying. I, I think. Uh my friend, for the, for the question. It's an example of what I was saying earlier on. Uh, this is not a question of Newport saying, we're going to get rid of beggars. It's a question of saying, look, is there a better way, a more humane way of helping people? And that's exactly what, uh, what, what you said. Uh, people donating money to organisations, I think, such as the Wallach as well, uh, to help people who are homeless, to create a fund of money for organisations that can help individuals. And that, to me, represents a very effective way of dealing with what can be public concerns, expressed to me, but also dealing with individuals who are at risk in a humane way. Question 7, Mohammed Ashraf. Question 7, Mohammed Ashraf. How does the Welsh Government ensure that the local authorities in Wales have sufficient land available to meet the demand for new housing developments, please? Well, the planning system plays a vital role in the delivery of new homes by identifying the land necessary to meet the housing requirements of communities which are determined by local planning authorities in their local development plans. Thank you for the answer, First Minister. The Welsh Government requires local planning authorities to maintain a five-year housing land supply to meet local demand for housing and to monitor this on an annual basis. However, Kerfili Council's local department plan has failed to ensure sufficient deliverable land has been made available to meet the needs they have identified for their local communities. Kerfili housing land supply position is being hampered by their failure to make progress in replacing their LDP following a review which began in 2013. What action will the First Minister take to ensure that Kafili Council meet the requirements regarding housing land supply 
set by his own government? Well, well first of all, uh, it's important that local authorities do have a five-year supply of land. Uh, secondly, it's important to have an up-to-date LDP because the alternative is a free-for-all, uh, and that's something that the local authorities will, will want to avoid. That said, I have to say it is hugely important uh, that Caerphilly and other authorities are able to work together to bring forward strategic development plans. Because it is an artificial divide to say, well, you know, uh, anybody who uh, wants to live in Caerphilly has to work in Caerphilly, or that somehow people don't work uh, in Cardiff from RCT or vice versa. The reality is that housing demand is not determined by local authority boundaries. And so I do want to see, uh, and I know it's something that, 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 that uh, is felt strongly by members who, who represent constituencies where there's pressure on housing, to see local authorities working together and saying, look, the reality is, you know, Cardiff, Caerphilly, Newport, RCT, just to give some examples, they're, they're part of a similar urban area. Housing demand will be the same in all local authorities. So it does make sense then to work together to deliver a strategic solution to housing demand rather than, as has historically been the case, simply looking at demand in one local authority area. That doesn't represent economic reality, and it's usually important that the local authorities, as they have been given in the Planning Act, are given the flexibility to work together to deliver housing solutions outside of their own boundaries. And finally, question eight, Dawn Bowden. Will the First Minister make a statement on the 21st Century Schools Investments Programme in Merthyr Tidville and Rumney? Well, Merthyr Tidville Local Authority has £19 million a year marked for Band A of the 21st Century Schools and Education Programme in the five years to 2019. Uh, the Caerphilly Authority, which of course she represents part of, has £56.5 million, of, of which over £8 million a year marked for <coughs> Rumney. And further investment is planned from 2019 when Band B begins. Thank you for that answer, First Minister. And I, uh, I recently had the great pleasure of officially opening the new build and uh, refurbished buildings as Golab and Tav uh, in my constituency. And I saw at first hand the benefits of the investments by the Welsh <coughs> Government in the future of, uh, of young learners there. And I'm sure you'll agree that such a development shows the clear benefits of our capital investment in education. Would you therefore agree with me that the new administration in Merthyr Tidville Council needs to build on this record of success and that a decisive and objective decision now needs to be made about the new school investment proposed for Asgola Greig in Kevin Coyd so that future funding of this project is not put at risk? Well, it, very good work has been done in Merthyr um, in terms of, as she mentions, of course, Asgol uh, Avon Tav. Uh, I was there, of course, to open the new college in Merthyr as well, a substantial improvement on the, uh, on the old <coughs> building. And it is hugely important that local authorities continue the momentum that has been established in order to see schools uh, replaced and refurbished uh, across Wales. And again, hugely important that decisions are taken in good time so as not to jeopardise uh, funding. That's in nobody's interest for that to happen. Thank you, First Minister. The next item is the...